Nick, happy Learn a Foreign Language Month. Among other things, did you know that December is Learn a Foreign Language Month? I did not know that. I am. I just you learned something brand new today. You know, Rick, we like to call them world languages. <laughs> that's more politically correct, I guess. Sorry, <laughs> that's. I think so. Yeah, okay. I think that's pretty much the. <laughs> Nick, are you, do, do you know foreign any other languages? Like I don't know that about you. Uh, no, I took a lot of French in high school, okay. but never followed it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, although I'm I'm relatively fluent in um, the language I made up on my own that isn't doesn't have a name or Yoda soda any real. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably Schnurp Nocter it's Nocter fun, pretty much. <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. Hey, How about what, you? What, did, what language did you take in high school? I uh, took uh, Spanish. Spanish and uh, got, got made some trips to Ecuador uh, for a few summers and, and got you know refreshed myself pretty good. But it's been a couple years, so I need to refresh myself and get on Duolingo and yeah, do it again. I like it. I don't know. I just kind of let it go. So. What's been going yeah, on? If you, don't practice, if, if, if you don't use it, you don't you lose it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, Rick, I had a um, I had a powerful experience last Thursday evening. Um, I figured I would just share briefly with our listeners. Um, this is it, it's a well, it's not it doesn't get graphic, but it's 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 potty it's potty humor. Not even humor. It's potty advice, potty wisdom. I guess you could say. Um, <laughs> that's why I I, it, that's I why our listeners it. tune in for potty wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> feel like it is sometimes um so and in in short uh and i did share this the next day with um some of my low incidence uh, special ed classes um, and they had some strong opinions as well which we can get to uh, after i tell the story but um so thursday evening was our um i was covering the choir concert at school um awesome event by uh, our awesome choir teacher hannah canal since her first year with us she did a great job but uh so that concert started at seven And school ended at about three and I had uh, normally that would have been a night I would have uh, been with Bella and Tali. So um, we weren't able to I wasn't able to pick them up and bring them back to the house. So I gave them the option. I could either go get them and we would go out to dinner or uh, they could cancel on me. We could just not do it, you know, not hang out that night or they could come back for the concert and they chose to go to dinner and then I'd bring them home. So we went to Bahama Breeze in King of Prussia, excellent restaurant Mm -hmm. um, for those in this area who maybe have visited a Bahama Breeze location. And from Bahama Breeze to the girls' house is only about five minutes, but then it's about a half hour back to my school. Um, So I knew I had about a 40-minute, you know, drive in the car ahead of me when we were leaving Bahama Breeze. And a small part of me knew I had to go to the bathroom. Uh, But I was like, you know... I really would rather wait till I get back to school because then I have what I consider home court bathroom advantage. Sure, you know, I sure. know that bathroom. That makes sense. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's an awesome bathroom. It has a bidet. I mean, it's oh, wow. everything you could ever dream of Fancy. for a bathroom. So five minutes from the restaurant to uh, dropping the girls off. And there we are. I get hugs saying goodbye. And then I was like, oh man, hmm. man, there is a part of me that would really like to, uh, tell the girls and Denise, um, their mom, uh, man, can I just borrow your bathroom real quick? Cause it's starting to become an issue. But I'm like, Nope, I want to make it. I can make it. It's just, you know, I, I this is something I can do. I'm a grown man. <laughs> I've, got, I've got letters behind my name. I mean, I, this is, this is, I can eat, I can make it. So I start to start to drive back to Downingtown on route 202 South. Um, and then I had a big decision to make about 20 minutes in because there's two routes you can take. Route number one is the more direct route, but it's also rush hour traffic. Uh, Potentially, either you're going to make it quick or you're going to hit a quagmire of traffic. Um, And choice number two, pretty much not going to hit too much traffic, but you'll hit some lights. Yeah, you're guaranteed about 15 minutes or so if you go that way. Well, I chose the potentially fast route, hoping that there wouldn't be as much traffic. And there was a ton of traffic. Uh And it was white knuckle, dripping sweat. Oh, no clenching thinking i am not going to make it what am i going to do if i don't make it i mean all those thoughts running through my head um so i exerted great mindfulness and power of will made it Mm. to school contemplated driving up the actual sidewalk of the school (laughs) to the front door which is highly illegal however is possible but i I said nope i'm going to do it my i'm going to make it 
So I was squeezing tight, uh, made it all the way to the front door, get in the door. There I am in the main office, like 6.15 at night. And wouldn't you know it, the custodians are cleaning that area right in front of the bathroom I have to go into. At this point, there's no detours possible. I It was, you know, straight into the bathroom, had to do it. Um, close call. I did make it. Kind of embarrassing. Um, and it was, uh, I just, I don't know what else to say, Rick, other than I had at least two opportunities to make a better decision earlier on in the night and I didn't do it. And uh, my students the next day when I asked them what they would have done, um, they shook their heads and looked at me and said, you should have just gone to the bathroom at the restaurant. I mean, yeah, really, it, it really was that simple. Yeah, it, it really was. You would have so, saved yourself a lot. That's of just a, but it is a success story, actually. When we get to the end, you made it. All is well. All is good. Yeah, I guess – yeah, it all ended, I guess, in a, a you know, it, it all, all is well that ends well, I guess. Um, but, you know, maybe if I hadn't been as lucky as I was, then I might have had a problem I couldn't have really solved. So uh, discretion is the better part of valor. So you, you that, live, that's you my story learn. for You tonight, live, right? you learn. I, I think – for our counselors and therapists, this is a, this is narrative therapy. As it, you put this challenge into a story, so this is a, yeah, this is good a good learning moment for for maybe for all of us, <laughs> for everyone, all our listeners out there. Um, one of whom, hey, quick shout out, Rick, before we uh, find out what you've been up to, uh, popped into one of my teachers' uh, classrooms. Her name is uh, Phoebe Hanna. She's an awesome learning support teacher. Actually, came to us from the Caribbean. She was teaching oh, wow. down in the Caribbean, and then. Uh, Joined us back here live, and uh, she has a great dog named Cappy, my favorite in the world. Um, and she's a listener, regular listener of the show. Oh, so um, now she knows all about how I almost uh, pooped myself. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, fantastic! So, uh, Rick, what, what are you what are you been up to? Uh, nothing nearly as exciting <laughs> or filled with drama. Um, we've been. <laughs> we're, we've been playing a lot of cards at my house. So, uh, played a, 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 a. Kaylee and Desi and I like to stay up late and play hearts. So we had a, a good evening of hearts the other night, playing Uno and Spot It with the Littles. Um, Christy and I even got back into playing cards, playing Skip Bow is one of our favorites. So just playing a lot of cards. I've, I've kind of made that kind of my determination that we're going to play more cards. Um, so, yeah, we've been – because I enjoy it. Every time we play, I'm like, oh, yeah, just playing cards is fun. So, um, yeah, I love all those. You guys play cards much? Uh, the girls like to play cards with Danielle. Um, I – Truth be told, I never got into card games. Mm. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, not suitable for work games like Cards Against Humanity and things like that. So uh, for Christmas, we actually bought a couple for the girls, a couple like, you know, kid friendly ones. Mm -hmm. Um, But but like you referenced Skippo. um, I don't know if it's the pressure, but it's too anxiety inducing for me. Like so for you guys, like you said, Hearts, Skippo, what are some of the other ones? Phase 10 is great. You guys like to play. Oh, my God. See? Got how do you? It's too much pressure. I'm sorry. Mm. Too much anxiety. Yeah. Not hearts either. Hearts is my favorite. No, no. Used to play spades, uh-huh. but I, I don't really remember how to play spades at this point. I need to re- yeah, watch a YouTube video or something. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like a, a quick tutorial yeah. on that one. Um, part of the reason is my sister Tina is ultra competitive, oh. um, which produces even more anxiety for me. Like the second I start playing, I know I can't win and I'm not going to win. And then I want to win and it just all becomes, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, that's, uh, oh, lots of, I don't know, man, lots of, lots of problems for me today. Don't <laughs> <I think. laughs> uh, how about the reading of a blog to cheer you up, Nick? How would that be? Well, that would be excellent. And, and I am, I got to tell the audience in advance, uh, not a, no spoilers here, but, I am jacked about tonight's blog. Oh, good. I'm glad. So many cool things to discuss. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. Well, I'm going to jump right in and go ahead and read it, folks. It is on the website at excellentadventure.com under the blog and the brochure. And tonight it'll be wrestling with the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. Ah, the first line, albeit a ghastly, one of my favorite Christmas stories, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. I grew up on the amazing, though terrifying to me as a kid, George C. Scott version. And I've come to appreciate many different adaptations over the years, including A Muppet Christmas Carol, which we've talked about on the show before, Jim Carrey's animated Disney interpretation, and John Luke, I mean, Patrick Stewart's version from the late 1990s. 
I tried to like the recently released Will Ferrell, Ryan Reynolds take on the classic Spirited, but as much as I like both those actors and the story, my wife and I turned it off at about a halfway point. Critiquing, critiquing Spirited, however, isn't the focus for our time together today. I'd like to reflect a little bit on the three ghosts or spirits in the story. Yeah, you know them. The ghosts of past, present, and future. Psychologists have suggested that our personalities are oriented along these same lines. They call it our temporal orientation. Some of us are more inclined to focus on the past, some on the present, and some on the future. As with many such things, there's no right or wrong way to be. There are, however, advantages and disadvantages for each orientation. And I think there's much value to considering our own alignment so that we can take full advantage of those, well, advantages and minimize the negative impact of the disadvantages. So let's take a look at each in turn. For those who are past-oriented, there's value in learning from past mistakes and successes as well. The ability to derive pleasure from positive memories, an innate ability to appreciate nostalgia, traditions, and ancestry, as well as great capacity for sharing those meaningful stories and formative experiences with others. On the other hand, those with a past orientation can ruminate or get stuck in past failures, disappointments, or traumas, finding it difficult to enjoy the present, focus on the task at hand, and or plan for a positive future. Present-oriented people often have an amazing ability to live fully in the moment, not carrying the weight of past burdens, nor being constrained by how their actions might negatively impact them or others in the future. Present-oriented people can be entertaining, spontaneous, and bring infectious enthusiasm to any gathering, event, or classroom. Present-oriented people can experience great success and enjoyment in their work, emanating from their enhanced ability to hyper-focus on the task at hand, a concept that renowned psychologist Mahai Csikszentmihalyi called experiencing flow. Jedi Master Yoda called it using the Force. On the other hand, present-oriented people are at risk for neither fully learning the lessons of the past nor considering how their current actions, however enjoyable, might not translate to future success. If the current season of life is particularly challenging, the present-oriented person might have difficulty being mindful that this too shall pass. There can also be a danger in the hyper-focus in one area of life resulting in deficits in others. For example, example, consider the incredibly focused and successful business person who neglects eating well or regular exercise, resulting in occupational success but problems with their physical health. Then there are the futurists. These visionaries can have a gift of foresight, providing valuable insight into actions which are necessary to set up future success. Those folks are often adept at planning enjoyable experiences for themselves and others. For the future who, thinker who is also an optimist, this orientation can help them approach life and challenges they encounter with hope, confidence, and expectancy. On the other hand, those with a future orientation can face challenges similar to those we already mentioned regarding the past-oriented people. Future thinking people can sometimes ruminate or get stuck in planning mode, finding it difficult to enjoy the present, learn from past experiences, focus on or prioritize the tasks at hand, enjoy the fruits of their labor and or appreciate how their predecessors' efforts have contributed to their own success. Additionally, and for the future thinker who is also pessimistic about what the future might hold, their efforts can seem hopeless, which can lead to a depressive state of mind. So which one are you? Or to put it another way, a visit from which Christmas ghost would benefit you the most? How does your orientation allow you to meet the demands of work or school that you're called to do in this season of life? How might that same orientation get in your way of optimal vocational or academic success? How does your orientation impact your personal relationships and or your physical health? The good news is that, while we're all likely to have a predisposition towards a particular orientation, there isn't a compelling argument or reason why we need to be stuck there. All of us have some control over our thoughts what we think about, how much we think about those things, and to what do we devote our time, efforts, and energies. Perhaps you, like me, have some ideas about how you can change your thinking, time, and attention to result in healthier, happier, and more successful outcomes. And as we attempt to make those minor but sometimes challenging adjustments, may we allow the words of Tiny Tim to inspire us along the way. God bless us, everyone. Hmm. Oh, there's a whole lot to unpack here, Rick, a whole lot. Hmm. Um, and you asked some very provocative questions in the blog, which I feel like um, our listeners really should uh, t take a visit to the website, um, excellentadventure.com. Uh, pop open the blog there and 
take some time. Maybe maybe that could be there um, your, for our listeners. Um, those of you who do practice mindfulness, those of you who take time out of your day to pray, um, those could be or reflect, um, you know, whatever word you use in that particular, um, you know, for that particular practice um, and think about those questions. Um, I, there are a lot of thoughts I had about um, this particular blog. Uh, I mean, just let me hit on a couple of them and then, um, you know, we, we can we can hit on any of those themes you want to yeah. or maybe resonated with you, Rick, mm-hmm. in terms of writing it. Uh, so the first thing, the first thing that um, really kind of struck me was just the conceit, conceit in a good way, not not um, being conceited. The conceit of the actual original story, which dealt with the three ghosts and the visits, um, and in a lot of ways, uh, that for me always tied back to uh, the views of of life, the way people view their lives, right? Like you talked about, um, you know, there's there's people who live in the past, people who live in the present, people who you know plan towards the future, um, and it always, for me, kind of tied back to the biblical story of uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel, um, mm. you know, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's a Google for you for, for those of you who um, uh, don't necessarily, uh, you know, like biblical stories. This is a good one. Um, and uh, Jacob, who was uh, having some issues at the time, essentially wrestled all night with an angel. Uh, some argued that the angel was God. Others said it was a guardian angel. Uh, he dislocated his hip early on in that encounter, so he was in tremendous pain. Um, and then by the end of the night, um, he had earned uh, the respect of the angel or God, and um, that was kind of vice versa and shared. And the reason that always kind of struck me with the Christmas um, a, a Christmas Carol story was because the reflection that the main characters do, whether it be Marley um, or uh, Jacob, in particular, are they were forced to confront decisions and things that they had done in their past. Um, they had to look at what was happening in the present. In Jacob's case, in particular, uh, you know the physical struggle of wrestling, which you used in the title of your blog, yeah. which is yeah, interesting, so apropos in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, forced him, to, you know, to be mindful, and also he had to look to the future in the sense of if he was able to emerge from that encounter alive. Same with the main character in a Christmas Carol, how is he going to move forward with his life? And yeah. that really allows for what I would, I would hope for people to say, well, there should be a balance between um, the, those who reflect on the past, those who live in the present, those who potentially live in the future. Yeah. yeah um, ideally. I which, think you're right. Which, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so that was first and foremost, that's kind of uh, what really hit me, um, you, you know, thinking about the blog there. Hmm. The second part, Um, was, I guess, more of the, from the empirical scientific realm. Um, And it's hard not to to think of that story, A Christmas Carol, without thinking about um, declinism, uh, you know, as a concept. So a better definition is available online, obviously. Let me just hit you with um, a quick recap of what is, what declinism is, essentially. Um, Scientifically, people experience emotions from the past more strongly than emotions from the present. And that makes the past seem more intense than the present. In particular, our memory tends to forget about the bad events in our past, and we have a tendency to re- uh, rehearse and dwell on the good things that happened. And we retell those stories a lot more often, so they become reinforced, the good memories as opposed to the bad memories. We remember the great songs of the past or the cars or the good old days, and we forget about the bad things that happened. That's also known as rosy retrospection. Mm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. the tendency mm-hmm. to, to view. It was Billy Joel once said, "The good old days weren't always good, and tomorrow ain't as bad as it seems." Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about you know, in, in from the scientific perspective of why we dwell on the past a lot of times, and then it becomes more difficult, perhaps, to be mindful living in the present, and the future seems negative. Which also brings us to um, that piece. A lot of people look at the future in a negative sense. Um, we give greater weight to negative things that happened. Something traumatic in the short term is going to be something more probably impactful than something good that happens in the short term. You know, looking for the future and things like that. Um, so it becomes a negativity bias or like a cognitive bias. Mm-hmm. So all of those things tie in again to where we just were with your original questions that kind of came from wrestling with the past, present, and the future. And in the end, I guess it all comes philosophically for me, it kind of comes down to that all three of those things are one and the same. So we, when you say we live in the p- people who are living in the past, if you're reflecting on something that happened in the past and 
you mentioned it. It can be in a healthy way. It can be in an unhealthy way. But you're spending, you're living the present moment by thinking about the past. So really, the past is the present. You're living it now. When you're thinking about the future, planning for the future, again, whether you want to put a negative or a positive spin on that, you are thinking about the future in the present. All of that occurs in the same time. So time's a construct we kind of create for ourselves. Yeah. So in closing, Rick, my the, the close on the whole thought there, um, big fan of a, a band called Mumford & Sons. And in one of their songs, um, which is probably my favorite song by them, it's called Awake My Soul. Um, they have a line in the song that says, uh, where you invest your love, you invest your life. And in short, I think that kind of ties into all three of those things. And that's what, uh, you know, the main character in the Christmas Carol kind of came to in the morning when he wakes up and realizes he, you know, could make some changes. Wow, Nick, fascinating that you, you, you went, you, you kind of cognitively went different places than where, where I was kind of at with it. I mean, that, that, that's awesome. I love that. Uh, and you mentioned the idea of kind of, you know, when we reflect on the past, whether it's positives or negatives, we bring it into the present because we're thinking about it in the present. And I'd say counselors and therapists utilize that to their advantage <laughs> because when they prompt people to talk about things in the past that have been hurtful, and what they're doing is bringing that really kind of those emotions and those cognitions into the present, which is hopefully in that present when you're talking with the counselor is bringing it into a, a, a more healthy environment. And so you, in some ways, what you end up doing is diluting that poisonous memory uh, as you kind of mix it with this positive experience you're getting uh, with a counselor or therapist or, uh, or perhaps even a good friend as you share a story about something painful that's happened to you in the past. So uh, fascinating. Nick, Nick, I'm curious when, when you kind of – kind of read through this i wonder if you identified yourself as kind of kind of having a, this predisposition now you mentioned it'd be really healthy to kind of have this balance right between all three but i wonder if you mm-hmm. if you kind of think well you know i probably lean more towards that way of thinking that's my temporal orientation did you notice that at all for yourself yeah my temp my temporal orientation um is definitely uh focus not focusing on is uh more uh, reflecting on the past to guide either the present or the future. Uh, uh-huh. Um, and it's, it's, uh, if it was therapy, um, you know, I've said before uh, on the show, um, after uh, Morty died, you know, we did that blog a yeah, little while back. Yeah. I had it, I had what, what I would, what was, I would consider an unbalanced reaction. It was an, a, an overreaction to that loss. Um, and going to therapy, one of the things I learned was that you can, actually do exactly what you said. You know what I mean? Um, Revisit things that have happened in the past and look at them through a lens that isn't as uh, hurtful, painful, or unhealthy. Um, And all of a sudden, that's kind of by doing that, it's like when you can let go of some of those things or come to peace with some of those things or as I learned to do, forgive, um, you know, young Nick, let's call him, Mm -hmm. for things that have Mm -hmm. happened in the past. It then those became positive lessons then, and you can then apply them more positively to the present and then look towards the future. But overall, from a temporal perspective, I definitely um, I connect very, very powerfully with um, memories from the past. Uh, I find it's much easier to connect for me to those than uh, things that are actually happening in the moment or living in the moment. So that's just me. Yeah. Um, How about you? Well, I just wanted to kind of respond and say, you know, that's not a shock to me to hear you say that, but I'd say it's one of the many things, Nick, that I appreciate about you is your capacity to tell stories about things that have happened before. And, and I really truly appreciate that um, for lots of different reasons, but, but, but some of those are that I've forgotten some of those stories. I I'm not there. (laughs) I I don't remember them. And so when you bring, it reminds me, it kind of it. You bring nostalgia for me of of that those college years, and it, it really I find that so soothing and helpful uh, to be to yeah to have my memory kind of prompted about some of those really fun fun times that we had so many years ago. So hmm, yeah, very cool. Hey, I'm I'm future oriented <laughs> without a doubt. I am future oriented, and it is it's a great thing for lots of reasons. Some of which I suggested it in the blog, but it also certainly gets in my way. <laughs> in fact. Um, yeah, I, I sometimes <laughs> I've been guilty of when on vacation with my family planning for the next vacation. 
<laughs> Christy scolded me last time we were on vacation, and rightly so. Uh, rather than enjoying, we're at the beach, relax and have fun. No, you know, I, no, I'm planning for what comes next and looking at airfare and, you know, how much is the rental cost? And I'm doing that kind of stuff rather than just kind of enjoying being in the moment. So, um, important for me to be able to center myself, to learn the lessons that Yoda was trying to teach Luke, right? Of always future, yeah, right? Never your mind on where you are, what you were doing. Like that's, I, I need to learn that lesson too, to be present and enjoy where I'm at. You know, it, it even, I'll harken back just for a few minutes ago, we talked about card games. I tell you, it's one of the reasons why is because that centers me. That brings me to the present. That's cognitively challenging and brings mm. my brain and my focus with my kids, with my wife, with my friends, with people I care about. So I'm not kind of at danger of ruminating about, you know, what are we doing next week or what's happening tomorrow? Or I'm, I'm not doing that because it brings me, it, it challenges me enough to pull me to the present. So again, just one of the reasons why I've been trying to do that more. Wow. We, I love that we're able to take playing card games and turn it into a deep philosophical <laughs> conversation. Hey, why not? Right. You do what works. Uh, you do what works, right? A- absolutely. Yeah. What hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so much, so much to uh, think about with that blog in particular. And um, yeah, I guess you can, like it's, it's could go so many different directions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, love to hear from our listeners too. Uh, feel free to please email, uh, email us at excellentadventure at gmail.com and let us know what you think, maybe how you're oriented and how, what kind of advantages or disadvantages you notice. You know, Rick, Rick if you wanted to email uh, the show and you can't remember the, our Gmail address, which you just said, mm-hmm. if you go onto the website, excellentadventure.com, right? Just excellentadventure.com. In the top right, it says contact mailbag. You can just click on that and then click on a link to the email and submit questions or comments or feedback or anything like that. Oh, very cool. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> that, that that's awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Good. Good stuff. Hey, Nick, why don't we uh, why don't we keep – speaking of looking at the future, let's move forward and take a look at our next developmental assets. So we've been kind of taking this journey or this adventure – through the Search Institute's developmental assets to kind of get a sense for what 50 years of research has revealed in regards to how how are kids tough despite tough circumstances? What factors are present in their life to help them endure? Uh, because the world can be a kind of a nasty place. So what helps kids get through it and be resilient? And again, 50 years of research, Search Institute's done a great job of kind of providing those results in a way that's clear uh, that, that, you know, not just researchers can benefit from, but teachers, administrators, coaches, parents, you know, anybody kind of who works with kids can kind of take a look at that and reflect and think, Hmm, yeah, how can I do that better? How, what other, what are advantages can I provide for my kids and my students to help them have success? And we are up to assets number 17 and 18. So we are almost at the halfway point here. So let me read through these two and then we'll spend a few minutes chatting about them. Number 17, creative activities. Young person spends three or more hours per week in lessons or practice in music, theater, or other arts. Number 18, youth programs. Young person spends three or more hours per week in sports, clubs, or organizations at school and or in the community. What are your thoughts about those ones, Nate? I think we spoke, um, obviously, at length, uh, you know, over talking about some of the pay- other assets in regards to how important extracurriculars are and, and how much of an influence a coach can have yeah. on you. Yeah. Um, you know, and, it, and when we say a coach, it does not speaking athletics. That could be your drama club coach, your mm-hmm. choir coach, your, um, you know, so many terms, but, you know, we, we associate coach with athletics right away. Yeah. Um, I, the first thing that speaks to me is that while 17 and 18th are both obviously important, um, you know, there is a lot of research out there that shows that success in school um, tends to uh, be higher, more impacted by activities you uh, participate in that are school related. Yeah, um, absolutely. So yeah. that's not, you know, that's not rocket science. Um mm-hmm. uh, Obviously, but that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind. I think the other important aspect of that is, though, and hopefully this is, you know, as the Search Institute and other people replicate and, you know, continue to do this type of research is is asking the question, um, how much can schools actually provide? And there's so much out there today, especially with um, our, our access to technology and information, that schools can't be everything. Mm-hmm. Um, they can't encompass every activity. But 
you, whether, whether it's geographically in your, your community or whether it's a community that is more broadly defined through uh, the Internet, perhaps, or, um, you know, we, we, I, we, I like to call them subreddits, uh, you know, like very specific genres or groups or things like that, um, where you, ha- you have access to or you can find access to these types of groups. Let's, so one quick example, um, you know, not every school is able to have a, a World of Warcraft club or a Dungeons and Dragons club. However, online, there are dozens of communities you can participate in to be a part of those types of activities. Within a lot of communities locally, um, and this is, I think, especially true in uh, towns that have a, a, a main street um, that actually still have bookstores or comic shops, you can find those types of gaming clubs uh, right there live, you know, and, and, and most of them do like a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night or a Thursday night. It's game night, you know, and this week we're playing Pandemic or, uh, you know, a train to uh, Ticket to Ride or um, Catan, one of those, basically. So I think that um, the access ability to access is there. I think that's it's hindered potentially by um, you know socio socioeconomic challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, some you know some families are going to have more resources and the ability to do more of these things or to help their child research more of these things. But the but the ability is there. So it goes well beyond the school community. And I think we just have to if we know our kid has a passion and it's something they want to pursue beyond just them being alone and doing it, you can find a community for it. Um, so I would say that those are my biggest thoughts in regards to that particular topic. And again, like there, this, this is an area where there's tons of research, obviously. Yeah. Nick, two things that, that kind of reactions that I have are two potential irrational reactions to these two, uh, as I share them. The first is one that kind of, <laughs> an irrational reaction that I have actually is, okay, so what I need to do is get three or more hours per week of my kids in the arts, three or more hours per week, my kids in sports. And then they're at school most of the day. I got to make sure that I help them with their homework. They got to do a home cook meal, not fast food. And then, oh yeah, I work and uh, my partner works and how, and, and we need to get them to bed at a decent time. And, and maybe we better spend time together in the evening as his family. There's not enough time to do all of that. That's freaking impossible. And to suggest or guilt parents into thinking you have to do this to have your kid be successful is just awful, right? And and that is and here's what I would say to that: that's not the suggestion. <laughs> that's not our suggestion. That's not Search Institute's suggestion. What Search Institute is basically saying is here are different kind of things that help kids be successful. Not you have to have all forty of them or your kid's doomed for failure. Not that whatsoever, but each of these things have been kind of an added benefit. And so it might be some of them are better fits, right? Maybe the athletic fit is a better piece for for a kid, but maybe for another kid, the art piece is a better. So it's not a matter of having both. It's a matter of maybe one or the other looking for opportunities. In fact, my wife and I just went through this a couple months ago is – uh, you know, we've got a strapping nine-year-old boy who, <laughs> who if left to his own devices – would be on his own devices <laughs> 24-7. He would play video games and be with his tablet. That's what he would do if left to his himself and his own decision making. Right. And so my wife and I think, oh, how what what can we get him involved in? What can what's available to school? What's available in the community? And for us, and I've mentioned this on the show before, it's been jujitsu. Uh, it, it is a great fit for him. And here's why, because he loves it. <laughs> it's not making him go like he wants to go. He wants to go to all the practices. He wants to go to the competitions uh, and he's, he's good at it too. So we pick something that not only he likes to do, but he's also really very good at it. So again, it, it's, yeah, I, I can't do everything, but, but what can I do that's a best fit for my kid? And some of that harkens back to things we've talked about even last time, which is goodness of fit parenting too. I've got this kiddo. This is who I am as a parent. What can work? <laughs> With the time that we have available, what can work? What can fit? So there's one kind of irrational reaction that I kind of have that I imagine other parents might have as well. Another one, though, Nick, would be the parent who says, no, my kid is getting all 40 and I'm going to make sure I cram every minute and second to make sure they get all 40 assets. They are going to be so t- – they are going to rule the world and the entire universe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm imagining, right, trying to get all 40 is going to probably end up being harmful <laughs> for the kiddo under consideration. So I think you'd be careful there. Now, each of these have an added benefit. Which ones are good fits for your family, your situation, the kiddo, their 
their personality, their talents, and what's available. And you mentioned it before. And, and you know, some of that is uh, what's available in your community. Some of that is what socioeconomically is available that's provided by the community or by the school. Or what do I have to pay out of pocket for? All those things uh, should be taken under consideration consideration when trying to identify good assets. The um well, obviously, those are uh, great caveats to think about for sure. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, one piece in particular. Now, we, we've talked a lot about um, the impact the pandemic had on uh, our students' mental health and the focus on social emotional learning and things like that in schools. Um, two pieces of uh, uh, research for, for data that I thought were particularly helpful for parents who have students that are going into high school or are in high school or getting ready to transition into high school. Um, this comes from the National Federation of High Schools, um, who, who quotes some research as far back as 2013, so it's pre-pandemic. Mm. However, I think it's um, pretty, pretty powerful in regards to um, what we're talking about. So here's one. Um, examination of data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health showed strong evidence that school extracurricular activities – were positively associated with adolescent friendships, both supporting existing friendships and developing new ones. Friendship ties were more likely to exist among activity co-participants while controlling for other friendship processes. The authors noted that extracurricular activities provide settings within schools uniquely poised to promote friendships as they are typically voluntary, safe settings that allow adolescents to interact and engage with their friends. So exactly what we were saying, um, you're taking a group of like-minded students interested in the same thing who are choosing to be there, Um, a a recipe for success. Um, And the second one, which I thought was also pretty important, this is a transition fact, um, a study looking at social adjustment and making the transition from middle school to high school found involvement in sports helps students with friendships during that transition. Uh, The authors wrote continuous involvement in sports and initiation of academic activities was associated with having more friendships. So as we are emerging uh, continually from the pandemic and looking for ways to continue um, having our students stay connected and uh, looking at their mental health, participation uh, is definitely um, uh, an asset or, you know, an asset that we should consider and hopefully be able to promote, not force. (laughs) <laughs> clearly not yeah. forced, but uh, clearly important. Yeah. Nick, what comes to mind for me too, as you share that is that it, there is such a profound benefit for kids being involved kind of in their schools. And we, we've talked in the past about um, in getting the teachers to be involved in those positions and roles like coaching, like art and music director and yep. the directors of plays as club advisors. And we've shared some strategies in the past about how how to kind of do that and do that in a way that's effective. But I want to just add one piece to that, just for our parents who are who are listening, um, just as a reminder <laughs> that. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but um, you know those club advisors and, and teachers and, and coaches, they're, they're probably not getting paid a whole lot extra to do this. They're probably doing it because they enjoy kids and they enjoy whatever kind of sport or activity that is. And they want to kind of play a part and make it, make a difference in kids' lives. So parents, give them some grace, <laughs> give them some grace. And I, I think that's probably true of kind of across activities, but I think especially when it, what comes to mind for me is high school sports and how kind of, uh, you know, invested parents get, into their kids' success and how they can be pretty hard on coaches sometimes. Um, and yeah, I, I think, yeah. I, and I get that piece too, because parents invest time and money and effort and, you know, so much into their kids and they want to see them be successful on the court, on the field. Um, but, but again, I, I said, be careful uh, with, with coaches who are altruistically out there just trying to, to, to support kids. Yeah, Grace uh, keeps it really keeps coming back to Grace, doesn't it? Yeah. In a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, Nick, Rick, any other thoughts on uh, these particular two? Uh... I don't think so, Nick. I'm ready for my favorite segment. Oh, man, this is one once again. Every rose has its thorn. It really it, the past couple of weeks have we really been bringing it with challenging challenging 
thought-provoking topics. Mm-hmm. Uh, lead us in, Rick. I mean, this is just this is just huge. Well, our listeners may not see just it, huge. but I am I am dressed for it today. I am dressed for it and ready. Got the Santa hat on. Our topic for today, this one actually comes from one of our listeners, one of our youngest little listeners, Holly from Tennessee, asks, "What's your favorite and least favorite Christmas movies?" First of all, this Holly must be a pretty special uh, person uh, to ask this type of question. Um, I just get the impression that someone named Holly from Tennessee is probably going to be smart, uh, <laughs> fun, mm-hmm. energetic, mm-hmm. Uh, maybe sassy, maybe some sass. Yeah, just you, you would know, think. Yeah, I'm just speculating. <laughs> I'm just total speculation there. Um, I definitely uh, I have a, a favorite. And my least favorite isn't truly a least favorite, but um, we'll kind of we'll, – we'll get to that part. Where do you want to start, Rick? Where do you want to start with this? Let's go with least. Like, I want to end on least? a positive. Can we start with the least favorites? Can we do it there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's and – it's, it's, any, any Christmas movie, any holiday movie, I'm in. I don't care how bad it mm. is. I'll watch it. Yeah. If it's on, I'll watch it. Yeah. Um, fun fact about uh, Nick and Deglio, um, I am a Hallmark Channel – Christmas oh. movie addict. Okay. Love them all. Didn't know that. Every single one. Uh-huh. You put one on in front of me, I'm going to watch the whole thing. Why? Because it has a happy ending. I know what's going to happen. <laughs> Sometimes I like happy endings. Uh-huh. Okay. But if I had to pick the least favorite Christmas movie, I'm going to go with the ones that are played on the networks like they do the 24-7 runs, right? Yeah. Um, and if I had to pick a least favorite among those, I would have to go with A Christmas Story as my least favorite. Oh, wow. wow. I like it. I Mold. like a Christmas story. Okay. I, yeah, I I enjoy I enjoy most parts of it. I think the dad is great. I think Ralphie every character in that story I love. In particular, that story when Ralphie's mom uh, takes care of him after he beats up the bully yeah. and kind of makes sure that you know it gets couched properly at the dinner table with dad. Like, you see the mom really looking out for Ralphie in mm-hmm. that scene, and to me, that really encapsulated who that mom character was, and really kind of. It really hit home for me. That was something I loved about it. But if I'm going to watch a Christmas movie all day long on one of those 24, 24-7 uh, marathons, Christmas Story is the one that I would I would be the least interested in watching over and over and over Interesting. again. So Nick, for least favorite, um, I'm couching it. I know. Yeah. Nick, did you watch the sequel, The Christmas Story Christmas? Not yet. I wanted to watch it with the girls oh, okay. and our weekend's coming up. Yeah. So I, I yeah. held off. Did you guys watch it? We did watch it. Yeah. And we, we kind of liked it. Now it's not going to be on my list here of, of, of best, of most favorite, but I, I think they captured some of the magic from the original, not all of the magic from the original, but some of it. We, we enjoyed it for sure. It was much better than the previous kind of attempt of a Christmas story part two, which just didn't, didn't work at all. I don't know if you've seen yeah. that one, but it didn't work. Uh, but yeah, but yeah was, there was some good stuff in there for sure. Okay. All right. My so what's, least, uh, what's your least yeah, favorite? My least favorite. I've got a, I've got a couple here. Um, I, I mentioned this one already today. I didn't like it. I don't know if you saw it. Spirited. Did you watch it? Didn't see it yet. That's yeah, on Apple TV. No. Yeah. It's again. It's Ryan Reynolds and uh, Will Ferrell. So I ha- expected big things. I've been looking forward to it for months. And again, halfway through, and I was like, nope, shut it off. So didn't like that. All- what was? It- Anything in particular that didn't work for you? Well, I kind of I, I got confused with the message. Like, I think they they really veered pretty significantly. They went pretty crude, which is a turnoff for me on Christmas movies. And I just absolutely, yeah, just 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 couldn't follow it. So uh, no, I didn't care for it. Hmm. Uh, but I've got a couple others to add here to least favorites. Um, all okay. all of the frosty sequels. I don't know if you've seen any of the Frosty sequels. <laughs> I've seen them all. I've seen them all, and I I agree with you. Yeah, it, pretty bad. Uh, uh, you're not gonna. Re- I don't know if you'll remember this. Uh, you might not. Uh, the Frosty sequel with John Goodman. Oh yeah. Where I believe it was an environmental. Yeah. <laughs> like a green, yeah. Uh, greenhouse effect. Yeah. Yeah. We watched that. It. We watched that at Penn State. And we, I think we watched the day. De- we might have been the, the debut, like a Wednesday oh night on ABC goodness. or something. Oh my goodness! And I remember we were both we were very upset. This is, about this it is exactly what we were it talking was, about early in, earlier, Nick. Because this is the nostalgia that I did not have that memory, but I'm just getting it back now that you're saying it. I'm yeah, just getting that memory yeah, back. We were. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was. It was. There was a. 
Yeah, I'm not sure how we let out our, our frustrations afterwards, but it was <laughs> yeah, not a happy not a happy half Probably hour. Probably the sock and boppers. Uh, <laughs> We'll continue. What, any other? The, yeah, any I got a couple favorites? more to add here. Sorry, I have strong feelings about the Christmas movie, so I appreciate Holly's question. Yeah. Um, all the Rudolph sequels, not the original, but the Rudolph sequels. So there's like Rudolph's Shiny New Year. There's Shiny New Year. Rudolph mm-hmm. and Frosty do Fourth of July or something. I don't know. I I didn't like him. Then there's this. There was a new kind of computer animation one in like 2010. Didn't work for me. Just didn't care for it. Never watched it again. So all the Rudolph sequels. And then I got one more kind of open category that I, I just – I can't say I don't like them. I just don't really watch them even though I know they're out there. Um, any really dark Christmas like Krampus, I've never watched it and I just would prefer not oh. to. And th- there's a new one okay. just came out, Violent Night. I'm, I haven't seen that. I probably won't watch that even though it's the guy from Stranger Things and I like him. But it's Dark Christmas and yeah. I just probably won't watch it. So that that's the least favorite. Yeah, totally, uh, totally understandable um, and appreciated. I don't look so Rudolph's Shiny New Year. I don't look at it as a Christmas uh, movie. Hmm. That's a New Year's movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> but small category there. <laughs> I can. Yeah, we're really. It's, yeah, you're really getting. You're, you're. It's focused in on that. But the difficult to. I can. It's still. You could define it as a Christmas movie because a lot of the characters are definitely um, ties back to Christmas. Um, so I will. That's the only Rudolph one I would make an exception for. I don't remember the 2010 computer animated one, but I might, I'll have to come back to that one. Um, yeah, that's that's those are I, I'm with you. I'm with you on pretty much all of those. Um, in particular, the Frosty sequels. Um, yeah. God, terrible, just terrible. Yeah. I mean, uh, what? Like, what? No, I'm, I'm not. I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> it's too. The wrong. end of Frosty. The, <laughs> The end of the original Frosty, right? <laughs> if you're not if you're not tearing up and crying when Frosty, you know, goes away, and you're like, man, he's gone for like a year, it, and she's not going to see him for a year, and she's she loved him so much. That's a long time to go. Like, yeah. absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder; it makes it grow sadder. And then you know, then you have these sequels where you're like, what? We're talking about. You know, natural gases and stuff? No. Uh-uh. Can't, can't do it. Can't do it. Nick, speaking of the end of Frosty, though, I do have one criticism of Frosty. As great as it is and as much of a classic as it is, I forget the little, okay. girl, I forget the little girl's name. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe I'm forgetting it. But too. we all know who she is. It, up here. I, I, it always disturbs me that Santa leaves her on the roof, on the top of the roof of her house. <laughs> there is no way down, and that, that house is tall. She is in for trouble. But apparently she gets to that parade, so she's okay. But it just bothers me. She just leaves her up there, and she's waving at him from the peak of the roof. I have no idea how she's getting down. So, yeah. Plot, what, you, also, uh, her name was Karen. Right? Yeah, there Karen. You go. thank you. Yeah, played by her voice was a uh, June Foray. Mm-hmm. Uh, did her voice? Um, wasn't she also? What did she wear a dress? Like I'm, she wore a skirt on Christmas Eve. Yeah. 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 And go and knowing she's going to the North Pole, like wouldn't you stop and get changed somewhere? Yeah, on that you one? would think. Yeah, poor decision making. Yeah, bad bad choices on uh, Karen's part. Yeah, with that one. she should have been involved in some kind of school based athletics. <laughs> she probably was an ice skater. I would imagine oh, she looked yeah, like an be. ice skater. <laughs> hey, yeah. Nick, how, you got some favorites? How about that? Oh, absolutely, I do. I have three favorites. Oh, good. Um, uh, so the first two are a, a part one and a part two. So right. uh, Tim Allen, um, the 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 Santa Claus. Yep. And the Santa Claus Two, mm-hmm. um, classics, absolutely perfect, perfectly cast. Those movies, I just feel like every even Santa Claus Three, which is definitely not one of my favorites, I thought had excellent casting throughout. Um, but just Tim Allen uh, makes the plays the the ultimate in that first one. Um, in particular, the scene when they go to uh, I guess was it an IHOP or a Holiday Inn. Um, cause he burnt the turkey yeah. and all the whole thing. And you saw the other, the other dad, Denny's. The I think it, was Denny's. it just Denny's yeah. Denny's. It was Denny's. Yeah. Um, it just perfectly encapsulated, um, you know, that whole feel. And then he, it goes into the fanciful part and everything. Um, my brother, my sister and I, uh, that was, we, we really embraced Santa Claus together. So those are ones we uh-huh. try to watch together every Christmas season. Nice. Um, so th- th- those are super, super, super high on the list. Nick, while we're there, favorite Christmas while movies. we're there, I got to ask you, have you watched the Disney plus the Santa Claus's the sequel kind of show? 
Not yet. Okay. We are okay. um what has it date did it Yeah, first did several they, episodes did they drop are out. All at once or th- Okay. So um I guess that's gonna be a we'll have to start binging maybe there with the go. girls this weekend. Or wait for or wait for the holiday break. I don't know. I don't know if I can wait. Uh-huh. Um I'm pretty excited about the whole uh, thing, but but anyway, uh, yeah. So those are those are my first two favorites. Um, again, the casting, like, um, oh god, Judge Reinhold is fantastic oh, yeah. as the oh, you yeah. know the step the stepdad. Mm-hmm. Um, his wife in the second one, who's the principal, um, which you know, finally we get a principal who's not a bad guy. A whole other different topic. Um, <laughs> however, my second my second one is also a, a little known um, Christmas movie. It's 1986 television film. So it was never in theaters, but it debuted on TV. Jim Henson and the Muppets. We watched it up at Penn State because I had the VHS tape uh, multiple times. And what people don't give it credit for is that it was Toy Story before Toy Story was Toy Story. Um, And this was called The Christmas Toy. So um, directed by Eric Till, produced by the Jim Henson Company. And it is um, essentially... The, the same exact story as the Toy, toy Story. Uh, you've got um, Christmas toys and stuffed animals, etc., who are alive, and except for when there are adults or humans around, and then they they have to go into uh, you know a, an unanimated state. And it's Christmas, and there's the big new present, uh, which is essentially Buzz Lightyear, but it's uh, a diff- Meteora is the name. And um, essentially, I mean, I'm I'm. It's the plot of the Toy Story, nine or ten years before Toy Story came out. But just done so well. Um, it just had a very uh, warm feeling to it, um, a super, super Christmassy feel, uh, more, a lot more, more so than uh, Toy Story was. Um, Kermit's the narrator um, of the show, so you do get a little bit of that in there. Um, and you've got the two, the two characters, um, Rugby and Mew. Um, Mew is a cat toy, and Rugby is the like – it would be the uh, – uh, oh God! What's who's the the Tom Hanks character? Um, Woody. Woody. Mm-hmm. He's like the Woody type character, um, and that's kind of what they all um, how that story goes. And you know, Mew gets in trouble, um, and they, they all the toys have to gather together to save him. And you know, Meteora doesn't realize she's a toy. Um, yeah, the more and more I think about it, they really the Toy Story totally ripped it off, <laughs> <laughs> like com- completely completely ripped it off. Um, so I'm not sure if you remember that one, but that's the, uh, I have no that, memory. That's my, this, uh, that's my all time favorite. No, I don't yeah. remember. Um, is I it, can I, can I YouTube it, Nick? That's a great question. Um, I still have the VHS thing. Wow. Um, okay. Which, you know, you can always bust out that, but let's, uh, as we're talking and we talk, move on to yours, I'll, I'll Google it real quick. Right, oh, that's you. Th- those all are right. your three Santa Claus one and two. And those are my three Christmas toy. All right. All right. Good, good, good. <laughs> All right, so I, I cheated a little bit here because I feel like the Christmas movies are kind of like my kids. I, I feel bad picking favorites and leaving some out. So I've got a, I've got a big list. Uh, I've got a big list, but here's how I've organized it. I've got a list of 12. I'm going to go through them very quickly. There are 12 amazing Christmas movies, and I'm going to give you my number one. It kind of stands apart from the rest. Okay? Make sense? Uh-huh. All right. Yeah, it sure does. And, yes, it is available on YouTube. Oh, I'm going to have to check this out. All right, good. All right. Um, yeah, I'll, put, I'll put a link in the, uh, the chat here. Cool. No particular order, these 12. No particular order. There's a bunch together here. Uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. The Grinch. Yep. Both the original animated Which as well as the Jim Carrey. Both of them. There's two. Okay. Uh, okay. The original Frosty. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Rudolph, the original. Prancer. I love Prancer. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Muppet Family Christmas. We've talked about that one in the show before. I love that one. Elf. In fact, they just put Elf on a 24-hour loop here last weekend, I think. I don't know if you saw that, but they did a 24-hour loop of no, Elf, I didn't. which was kind of cool. Uh, oh, like a, a TNT or a TBS? Yeah, I think TBS maybe, yeah. Um, you mentioned yeah. this one earlier. A Christmas Story I have is one of my top, uh, well, 13, I guess. Um, Die Hard, which is a Christmas movie. Mm-hmm. It is a Christmas movie. Yeah. Yep. And we've firmly established in the – Ho, ho, ho. Exactly. Exactly. Now I have a machine gun too. Oh, ho, ho. yeah. Uh, and Rocky Four, which we've established, is also a Christmas movie. <laughs> so there's there's my twelve yes. big ones right there in no particular order, uh, leading up to my number one, which is the classic. It's a Wonderful Life. There we go. 
Um, so can, can I ask you a question about It's a Wonderful Life? Have you thought about it recently in context of the the mental health, the focus on mental health lately? And um, I, I guess I, I, it's one of those things where um, there's been such a – we're so um, maybe hypersensitive to uh, mental illness and signs of suicide and things like that where – when watching it's a wonderful life now, like there's part of me thinking, Oh man, he's, he's exhibiting many of the signs of, you know, we, we should get some, get some help for him. <laughs> it's a good um, point. <laughs> it's a good point for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 my brain doesn't necessarily go there as a counselor, but I can see how it, it might and probably how it will in the future. Thank you, Nick. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just ruined your favorite Christmas movie. Of all time. <laughs> No, that's right. I love It's a Wonderful Life. I've loved it since I was a kid. Enjoy it. I only watch it once a year, right before Christmas, and uh, it's a special time to just sit down and watch it. So, yeah, that's my favorite right there. I do a kind of uh, do the colorized version. I prefer that one. So, really, yeah, huh? Yeah. Okay, that surprises me. I would have I would have uh, pegged you as a traditionalist mm-hmm. for the uh, old black and white. Yeah. No, I like the colorized version. Thank you, Holly. Thank so you, Holly, many, for um, getting us going on that thorn and a rose in the thorn this time. Yeah, I, you know, I think Holly, even though I don't know this Holly, but I think she would enjoy the Christmas toy. I did. Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So just go to YouTube, uh, Google a Christmas to- or Google. Go to YouTube, search for the Christmas toy, oh, nineteen eighty six. The Christmas, and toy. there's a couple links there. All right, yeah. cool. I put it in the chat as well. Awesome. Mailbag time. Cool. Got some good questions here today. Yes, we do. All right, let me dig in here to our email bag and pull out the first one from Alex and Mandy, originally from Texas, but now stationed in and writing from Germany. And they say, we moved to Germany a few months ago. Our 12-year-old son is having trouble adjusting to school here. Any suggestions? Thoughts, Nick? Well, yeah, actually, yeah. So, Alex and Mandy, uh, thanks for writing in. Hope things are going well uh, for you for for you guys overall in Germany. Um, so one of um, my favorite people who've ever lived on this planet. Her name is Stacy Tuckloff Van Zant. We call her TV. Um, she used to run the TV studio as well. So, it's a fitting nickname. Um, she's the instructional coach at our school, so she helps uh, teach teachers. But she previously was a uh, world language teacher. Uh, she teaches both Spanish and German. And she's well traveled. She's she's lived all over the world, and um, she's always uh, willing to take an adventure. So I, um, thinking that this might have been one of the questions you pulled from the bag, um, I asked for a little bit of feedback from her, yeah. and she uh, gave me this tidbit to share. So this is from uh, Stacy TV. She put first: try to find some American families to connect with. Set up times to Zoom or FaceTime with your friends back in the states. Also, try to ter- determine exactly what it is that you're missing. It's likely that it could be replicated in Germany, but if not, look for new experiences and try to create new traditions in the country you're living in. Um, I asked her to follow that up a little bit. I said, any organizations or specific groups uh, in Germany, uh, perhaps that Americans could look to connect with? And she wrote, um, the town she lived in actually had a German-American group. Some were Americans who had married Germans and stayed. They organized the Thanksgiving celebration. They, uh, the, the family, this family we're talking about here, Alex and Mandy, they should check with the equivalent of the Chamber of Commerce and see if there's a university who might have an exchange program that you could connect with um, and perhaps um, you know make some inroads there in, for, in terms of building relationships. Wow. I don't want to follow that. That was brilliant wisdom. That that was amazing. Thank you. Th- say her name again, Nick. Uh, Stacy Tuckloff Van Zant, but we just call her TV. <laughs> TV Stacy. Thank you. That that was amazing. Thank you. Good stuff. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to add to it other than just saying, Alex and Mandy and your family. Thank you for your service. It sounds like you're uh, in the armed forces. So thank you for your service. Brilliant wisdom. Thank you. Absolutely. Hmm. Definitely. Mm-hmm. All right, we got another one. Uh, we do. Uh, Rick, go ahead, give it to us because this is a this is all right. This is hard, big stuff right here. 
we don't have I don't know where this one comes from. It just kind of comes in the in the mailbag. If your life were made into a movie, who would you want to play you, your character? Yeah, this is a uh, I mean, I've thought about this many times. <laughs> so, it's already You've already got this planned. You've got the screenplay ready? Like <laughs> yeah, I mean, I pretty much it's it's hard to uh, you know it's we, we, we come on, it is what it is. Let me guess, you're just, um, you're just going to play Richard yourself. Should... You're refusing to well, give it up. I feel like I would play it way over the top. <laughs> 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 uh, um, I'm I'm very curious for your input on this one because okay. it, it the uh, my answer has never changed um, hmm. since the early 2000s. If I could have someone play me in a movie, it would be Kevin James. Oh, oh, I love that. I love that pick. I love that pick. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. Yeah, that's my – that's it's about as good as it gets right there. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever, uh, did, any, anything – go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say anything he's been in, uh, yeah. from Paul Blart Mall Cop to Here Comes the Boom to uh, obviously every, um, um, King of Queens. Yeah. Um, he, I just I, – it's one of those – he's one of the those actors who does the kind of movies where I laugh out loud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that just – nothing what's, – what's better than that, right? Like it's just – you know. Yeah. Oh, that, that's perfect. That's perfect. I love it. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, have you ever seen his stand-up routine where he does pizza math? That is one of my favorite skits of all time. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, we love Kevin James. Uh, that's yeah, one of my um, good. That's a good one. One of my all-time favorite episodes of King and Queens is also when uh, Lou Ferrigno is personal training him, but they're actually just playing video games. <laughs> 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 and, as, and they get caught. His wife catches him. Uh, it's, a, it's perfect. So funny. Yeah, uh, that's great. <laughs> uh, so what, what do you got, Rick? Who Who is playing Rick Aubrey? Okay. All right. Um, I My selection is going to be a actor named Ryan Hurst. Ryan Hurst Ooh. plays Beta in The Walking Dead, but he is probably best well known for being Gary Brutier in Remember the Titans. And I had been told in the past that when I was that age, I looked like – Gary Bertier, which Ryan Hurst, and uh, so that's that's my pick. Well, Rick, I'm going to have to disagree with something you said right there. Uh, you said best known for The Walking Dead. Ah, some would argue he's best known for Sons of Anarchy. Uh, okay, see, I don't. I've never watched that show, but yeah, good point. Good point. I've never watched it, so he has a major role in that. I guess. Yes, Opie. Uh, he's Opie. Um, okay. And it's a major role. Huh. Um, he plays the best friend of the main character, Jax. Um, whew, it's really good. Really good. Mm. Um, he is also the voice of Kratos in the God of War, the two God of War games uh, most recently, mm. um, which are just phenomenal uh, video games. So he's a great he's a great choice. Why? Uh, what in particular? What caught your what what's what spoke to you that said this is Rick Aubrey? You know, I think it's that character from Remember the Titans. Number number one is the best movie, one of the best movies of all time, for sure. Right. That's a separate discussion we will have at some point is best movies of all time. But that's certainly uh, definitely. in the mix for me. And, of course, he was a, a football player. And, again, I have had many people over the years say that, yeah, that I look like him. So, uh, and, and I think he's super cool in Walking Dead, and I liked him in that movie. So, yeah, be a good choice. That's a great choice. Um, I have to correct myself, Rick, because um, I just IMDb'd Ryan Hurst. Uh, he doesn't do Kratos' voice. He does Thor's voice oh. um, in the Ragnarok game, okay. in the God of War game. So, okay. yeah. Uh, still awesome, any way you look at it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> wow. That's, that's those great choices. Ryan Hurst and Kevin James. What if they did a podcast? I wonder if it would be as good as ours. Wow. Art imitating life. That would be. Or life imitating art, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it would that would be interesting. Mm. Definitely would be interesting. Yeah, have to work on that one. Oh, well, uh, I wonder. I don't know uh, if we. I wonder if Rufus selected somebody to play him, who he would select. I would love to hear. I, I wonder if it would be someone we know, or would it be an actor from the future? Yeah, that's I feel true. Like he would, would have, have no idea. Someone. He'd have to describe the actor to us. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Rufus, you might have to weigh in on this particular uh, question too. Who would play Rufus in the movie? Hmm. Folks, keep those questions pouring into the email bag at excellentadventure at gmail.com. This is an easy question because it's already happened in the future. You see, I don't have to think about who would play me because in my timeline, somebody already has played me, and it was Charlie Day. Yes, Charlie Day from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, amongst other great shows and films. Once you see it in your mind, you can't unsee it. <laughs>